Welcome to this bit unusual session, as in this session we are not going to see beautiful slides, you are just going to see a couple of pictures and a lot of code. My name is Clément Scoffier, I'm working at Red Hat in the Vertex team, and in the next uh, 15 min minutes I'm going to develop a couple of reactive microservices, deploy them on top of Kubernetes, and explain you how it works and how Kubernetes and uh, its way to manage resilience or its way to manage uh, HTTP core and so on will help you to become ready and to build reactive systems. But I've mentioned a couple of things. The first thing is that we're, I'm going to build reactive uh, microservices. But what does reactive mean? Actually, reactive mean very, something very simple. It's just a reactive software and just a software showing responses to stimuli. And in the reactive landscape, we have really three different domains. The first one is reactive systems. And reactive systems is just about making distributed, in, distributed system right. It's all based on this idea that every interaction are asynchronous and use message passing. And because of this, it gives you elasticity and resilience, and you become responsive. However, developing a reactive systems can be a bit complicated. So here is the second part of the reactive landscape, which is a uh, at the API level, it's reactive programming. So reactive programming is, a, is an API based on the concept of data stream, data flow. Uh, it proposes a lot of um, uh, operators, and what it helps you to do, it will help you to compose Haven-based asynchronous software. So it makes a lot of sense when you want to build a reactive system because, well, reactive system are asynchronous, and now we have an API that will let you write this code. The only issue with data flow is that you want to push things. But what about when uh, the processor uh, is not able to keep up? In that case, you need to be able to slow down your system. And here comes the third reactive part of this landscape, which is reactive streams. Reactive streams is a model uh, for asynchronous non-blocking back pressure. So I also say that I want to develop microservices. Who did say that microservices are going to be easy? Before, we were doing monoliths. Everything was inside the same GVM or same platform. Everything was fine. But yeah, OK, as updating was taking months. And now we want to ship features um, really, really fast. So the idea behind microservices is to say, OK, we are going to take this monolith and extract all this part. And all this part are going to be individually develop, deploy, um, manage, dispose at any time. So before we had one monolith, nothing was moving. And now we have a set of things, and everything can move at any time. Great idea. So when we want to do that, you need to have a kind of infrastructure that will help you to deploy, manage, and keep everything on track. And in this presentation, I'm going to use uh, OpenShift. OpenShift is a layer on top of Kubernetes. And what Kubernetes is, it's a container platform. So you have an operating system somewhere, and on top of that, you have Kubernetes that will provide you a set of features to deploy your application package inside containers, generally Docker containers. So it will manage the networking be between your different Docker containers, it will manage the storage, the volumes, and so on, the Docker registry where your image are, log metrics, and security. On top of that, OpenShift is providing two main features, the build automation and the deployment automation. So what it lets you to do, so typically you are pushing a change to GitHub or something like that, or to your source code, it will detect the change, rebuild your container, and redeploy it uh, inside your environment without downtime, because we are going to see that uh, uh, there is rolling update and stuff like that. It also provides uh, provide a couple of images and runtimes and stuff like that. So, we are going to develop and deploy microservices running inside container. So great, they are going to be isolated. Yeah. Only issue is that they are isolated on the top, but they are sharing the same infrastructure. When you have a set of containers, they are sharing the same CPU. Because at some point in time, somewhere in the world, there is a CPU that is executing your application. Nothing you can do about that. It exists. So, when you deploy three containers, for example, side by side, they're all sharing the same resources. So containers is not about isolation. It's about sharing. And when you think about that, that makes the whole container 
ID a lot more complicated because if your uh, application is taking a lot of memory, a lot of CPU cycle, it's the other container get less. So what happens is that you will get a quota, and you need to use the CPU and memory quota, this constraint, in an efficient manner. And for this, you need to change a bit how you are developing your application to use efficiently the resources that are granted. And to implement my microservices, I'm going to use Vertex. Vertex, or Eclipse Vertex, because it's hosting as a uh, Eclipse Software Foundation, um, is a toolkit to build reactive and distributed systems that use your CPU and your memory in an efficient way. Low number of threads, very few memory. We will see the, the number. Uh, the fact that it uses a very low number of threads is very, very important because you don't pay the price when you switch between thread. The application I'm going to develop are all single threaded. So that means that when you have one thread, you don't switch. There is no context switch. So as you are in no context switch, you are saving the CPU time that is used for context switch. So imagine an application that are 1,000 threads, and in the Java world, it's not surprising, it exists, you are going to burn your quota, CPU quota, just switching between threads. That's not efficient. So, I'm end of talking. It's time to get some code running. So I'm going to do um, to fix the first world problem. At least for me, it's a very, very important problem: is managing my shopping list. Yes, um, you will see the issue I have with my shopping list. So I'm going to create a new uh, uh, Vertex microservice. So I'm using the Vertex uh, Maven plugin. It's not required, you can use whatever you want. Vertex is just a library, so you package your application as you want. I just uh, created um, uh, a default project with a couple of dependency. I'm going to add it to the Maven project. Yes, no? Yes. You don't want to do that? Yeah. And I've created, it has automatically created, uh, ooh. Yeah, okay. Why didn't? Let me see what it has generated. Um, yeah, so it's a just a Maven project with a couple of uh, dependency, and I'm going to update to the latest one. That should be fine. And no, yes, okay, that's right. Uh, and when you do a vertex application, the first thing you will do is to write a vertical. And a vertical is just a piece of code that is going to be deployed on top of, of a vertex. And then the hello world of vertex is very simple. You will create an HTTP server. You will get request. And here we will see the reactive flavor of vertex. Every time you get a request, this handler is called, and you will uh, respond to this um, request, for example, hello hosting. And you also need to start on the port 8080. And I hope that I'm not going, I'm not using it in the background. So then I will just build and run this application. So again, this is a Vertex Maven plugin that is doing there. If you prefer Gradle, we have Gradle support. If you prefer SBT, we have SBT. We well, almost anything. If you prefer Ant or Make, well, it's just a library. So as soon as you can compile and start a Java process, it's fine. So now if I go there, we have hello Austin, right? So one thing which is interesting to do here is to happen something like the name of the thread that is on bringing uh, this request. And now if I refresh here, and I will refresh here right times, you see that I have always, I'm always handled by the same thread. I can have 10,000 requests that arrive because all Vertex is asynchronous, non-blocking. It will always use the same thread. It's an event loop, so it comes with some responsibility. You are not allowed to block the event loop. Why? Because you have a set of events that are coming, and the event loop is taking the event, finding the right callback, the right handler, and then next event, and so on. If one of your handlers is blocking the event loop, the number of events you will have in the queue will grow, 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 until you reach out of memory. And again, Vertex wants to use your um, CPU and memory in an efficient way, so you should not do that. So it's totally forbidden to, uh, uh, to uh, block the event loop. And if you try, you will see that Vertex is complaining a lot, and as Vertex is mostly developed by French people, we are very good at yelling. Believe me. So 
Okay, but I say that I want to develop a shopping list management. And I'm going to do a very simple model for my shopping list. I'm going to use a map. The key is going to be my product name, and the value is going to be the quantity of this product. Uh, I will call that a list, because a map called list, that's fun. Uh, that's going to be an hash map. Yes, fine. And now I want a kind of restful API. And for this, I'm not going to do things here, because that would be way too complicated to do if it's a get and slash uh, on the path and so on. No, no, no. We are going to use something we call router. And a router is an object uh, that will actually implement all the boilerplate you need when you do a REST API. So, for example, uh, if I have a request get on slash, I will just do well, what I'm doing here. That's fine. Just say, hello, hosting. Um, now, if I do a get on slash shopping, let's do something like, let's see, um, um, get list. So I'm using a method reference, a Java 8 method reference. It just, we are going to implement them. If I do a post on slash shopping, I will do an add to list. For performance reason, Vertex do not pass the payload of your request by default. So we just need to tell him. So handler, body handler, dot create. OK. And we will also do a delete if I want to remove something from my shopping list, something called name. So that's the name of my product. I will do this. This dot delete from list. OK. It's time to implement this method. And here's double colon. So the first thing is get list. So in Vertex, we are really, really fan of JSON. We, everything is JSON, more or less. So we come up with our own way to manage JSON. And here, what I will do is to just write in my response, uh, well, my list. Done. Oh, here it's complaining because yeah, obviously it doesn't compile. So I say, yeah, it doesn't compile. Um, add to list is going to be almost the same thing. Again, we are very, very um, uh, JSON oriented, so I will just get the body as JSON. We have a JSON object. I'm going to get the product name as the string name, okay? And I'm going to have the quantity as the integer quantity. And if it's not set, we'll set this sensible default to one. And now I just need to add this to my list. OK, great. And now let's return the list. The list. So to do that, I will just call the other method. Fine. And now delete from list. Uh, well, very simple. I'm going to take uh, the pass parameter name here. name, and I will remove that from my list. I don't care if it was there or not, and then just do get list. None of, the, none of this is blocking, and everything is going to be managed by the same thread. The only thing is that we need to modify this to call the router, and actually, we are just calling the accept method of the router that will get the request, look inside the root, call the root. That's all. And now it's compiled again. And let's try. Here we have hello hosting. And if I do shopping, we have an empty shopping list. OK, great. I'm going to add a couple of things here, like, yeah. I'm going to add beer, because beer is fine. And I probably need a bit of coffee, too. And I need way more than at least 10 coffee. And we see here, immediately, we have coffee and beer. And if I go back here, I have no coffee and beer. Fine, great. My REST API is working. Let's try the delete one. Um, if I want to delete the coffee, which would be very sad, but we never know, I need to remove all this part. We just have beer. So it's working. We have a REST API working. Let's 
try to deploy this uh, on top of OpenShift, and uh, so on top of Kubernetes. But before doing that, I need to explain you a couple of things um, in uh, OpenShift. So what we, when the first time you try Kubernetes on OpenShift, you have a way many, well, we have way too many entities you need to understand. It's kind of complicated, so I've made these pictures, and if you understand this picture, you understand everything from the developer point of view. As a developer, we have source code. It's what we read, it's what we produce, it's what we like. We are going to send this source code to OpenShift, and we will have provided to OpenShift a build config that say, okay, when there is a change in your source code, I'm going to build it. It provides a Docker image that will be registered in the Docker registry from Kubernetes. We are also going to provide a deployment config that say, oh, when I have a Docker image with that name or change in that Docker image, I'm going to deploy it and it create a deployment object, and this deployment object is responsible to keep a number of pods running. What is a pod? A pod is a group of containers, typically one. They are collocated, but yeah. Um, so let's say that it's just a group of containers. So we have the pod here. The deployment is a manager of this pod, so it provides supervision and will be sure that if you say that the deployment, I want one pod of them, and if this pod die, it will recreate it immediately. We are going to see that. OK, so that was the developer pipeline. But the user pipeline, as this browser here, is going to hit a, public, a publicly available URL, which is called a root. This root is going to delegate to an internal IP, internal URL, which is named a service. That's a Kubernetes entity. And a service is going to delegate to a pod. Simple. So don't worry. We don't have to write all of this. So as I said, um, we want to uh, uh, deploy our application inside a Docker container. So to do that, I'm going to create a Docker file. This Docker file, oops. This Docker file is relatively simple. Uh, I just, I will package my application as a fat jar. I take uh, Java 8 Alpine, uh, which is a bit deprecated, but well, this one still works. I'm going to expose the port 8080. I'm copying my fudger somewhere in my container, and I'm starting it. So now that I have a Docker file, I will just run a script that will, where well, I am, no, wrong one. I would stop this, build with Docker, and what this is going to do is just creating my a default deployment, default build config, building my fudger using Maven package, that's all, send, my fudger to OpenShift, and if we go back to OpenShift quickly here, and if I go to build, we see it running. So what it is doing, we can check, check the log. Oh, it just, just executed the Docker file. So what it has found, it said, like, well, you send me this, there is a Docker file. I know what to do with the Docker file, I'm going to execute it. It just executed, copy the fudger that we have pushed there, and done, and here we see that he has published the image uh, to the Docker registry. So if I go to images here, we see the shopping backend is there. So my script also creates a default configuration with a root, a service, and one pod, the simple thing. So it's there. We have uh, our deployment name here. It's the first deployment, so version one. That's my public root. That's my pod that is running. Uh, we have an internal service called shopping backend, so this route delegate to this one, and that's all. So now, if I go there, I got hello Austin, let me do that bigger, and if I go to shopping, I have an empty shopping list because, of course, it's running on the cloud, but I need to add stuff. So I'm going to add in this, um, uh, in this, uh, uh, service, my favorite um, breakfast, coffee, eggs, and bacon. Well, we are in the US, so bacon is mandatory. Um, so now, if I refresh here, I have eggs, bacon, and coffee. So what does my script do? It just post request, just because it's boring to write, so you just have the post request, now we have eggs, bacon, and coffee, right? So when you are on the cloud, so generally why you are on the cloud is because you want scalability. And a Kubernetes scalability, just those two button here, and I'm going to do this. So instead of having one pod, it gets a second pod. So now I have two pods backing up my service. Okay, 
Let's check. Does that still work? Yes, it works. Mm, does that still work? Really? Let's try. Oh, I got an empty. An empty list. The list here, empty list. The list here, and then an empty list. The first of all problem for me, split shopping list. Your shopping list is never the one from your husband, wife, friends, roommate, whatever. You all, your shopping list is always off by a set of products and it's always your fault. We, are, we need to fix that. But just to understand a little bit more the issue, I'm going to modify here and to add a header that one we call xpod. And I'm going to use a hack, so don't say that. But actually, in OpenShift and in Kubernetes, it's the same thing. If I ask for this environment variable, it's going to give me the name of the pod. This is an implementation specific, so don't use it. Or use it, but don't say that I told you to do that. I'm going to redeploy. Build. So it's going to uh, redo the Maven build. OpenShift and Kubernetes are important. So if an entity already exists, well, I will just say, OK, your service, your build configuration already exists. I'm not going to recreate them. So I'm uploading the Fadjar to OpenShift. Ta -da -da. If we go back here, we can start seeing, oh, we see here a rolling update. So instead of starting, uh, stopping the app and restarting it, it will try to start the new one, wait until it believes it's ready, and then stop the first one. And when the new one are ready, it will root the request. So now, if I'm here, and I'm going to go here and get my shopping list, we see this. So the X pod here, we have the pod 2 and 4. And this pod is, uh, is empty, yeah, because I need to populate things. Let's forget to do that. Oh, that was interesting. When on this pod here, 7SS, we have eggs. And on the other one, we have bacon and coffee. So what's happening here? Actually, when we have two pods, the root is going to do a round robin between the different pods. And as the memory is not shared, because it's internal to the JVM and to, so to the container, it doesn't work. So really, the split, uh, the split uh, shopping list issue. So to fix that, we need to share a data store. And it's what I'm going to do now. And I'm going to use Redis. So Redis is a very simple key value data store. Um, I'm going to do private. So uh, to, to model my shopping list uh, very simply, I will write everything to a key that I will name shopping. But the issue is that instead of this map here, I need to have a Redis client. Let's call it Redis. But where is my Redis client? I'm on the cloud. I don't know. It probably has been developed by my ops or something like that. And my ops told me, don't worry, your Redis client is accessible using this name here, the service name. So I don't know if you see it's called Redis. Yeah. I've not been very creative when I did this name. But I need to discover it. So how I'm going to discover it? Well, just using service discovery. Vertex comes with its own service discovery, and when it's running on top of Kubernetes, it will just connect to the Kubernetes services and tell me that the Redis services is the right one. So then I just need to say, I'm looking for Redis data source. Um, I pass discovery. And this Redis data source, I know that its name is Redis. OK. And when you have done this, it's asynchronous. I need to check whether the lookup has been successful or not. If it failed, OK, let's do something sensible that we all do as developers, is writing an interesting error message. Something like that. Obviously, if we have the service, so if we have been successful, so I have my, client, my Redis client, Redis. When this is done, I can start my HTTP server, because I should be able to handle my request. Great. There we go. Um, unfortunately, I need to modify all of this. So let's start with, by removing. So 
Redis, again, it's a, a key value data store. I'm using the Vertex Redis client, all asynchronous, all non-blocking, and to delete, I'm going to delete uh, from my key, key, so shopping, uh, name, and I don't care about the result because what I'm going to do is just calling this. Um, I'm going to copy this. So here it's almost the same. I'm going to add, so it's set key name quantity dot to string. Our API is doing that. Okay, and here, oh, here it's a bit more tricky because I need to ask Redis to give me all the uh, all the my, my shopping needs. So this is going to be a result. It may have failed. So in that case, I'm going to fail directly on my HTTP request uh, by generating a 500 uh, error page. This is configurable, of course. And if it has been successful, then my result is a JSON object. JSON. And I'm just going to write this inside my HTTP response. I'm going to copy this. JSON dot encode. I will just use encode for now. Great. Now it's compiled. Everybody is happy. So let's redeploy this version. We will see uh, the rolling update again. It's going to start. So, yep. Does it start? Yes, so here we see the build log here. So we are at the build three. Same Docker file, so it's reuse the, the ones that has been there before. Up, rolling update again. Now this is a, uh, my minishift bug because I closed and opened my lid. And yeah, it's a bit off in terms of time, but should not matter. OK, fine. So now, if I'm back here, it probably say nothing because the Redis database is empty. So I just need to um, uh, populate things. Oh. And now we can see that it's using both pods, so 151 and uh, 05BO. But if I go there, I get my complete list. Great. So as I said, uh, we have a rolling update here. And uh, Kubernetes um, is trying to detect when the pod is ready before stopping the previous pod. The only issue is that Kubernetes is trying to make an educated guess when the pod is ready. And you know what? Kubernetes is not smart. We have to help him a little bit. So let's help him. I will go to my deployment here, configuration, and I'm going to configure uh, health checks. So we have two types of health checks, readiness. Readiness are used in rolling update and will be pinged by Kubernetes. And when it gets to 200, we'll say, OK, you're ready. I will use slash, so the hello hosting. So when we, have, when we are displaying hello hosting, uh, it will consider that fine. And we have also liveness check. I will use the same uh, uh, endpoint, but normally it's probably a two. And liveness is going to be used by Kubernetes to detect when my application die. I'm saving that, and now it's redoing the deployment here. Is pinging, pinging, pinging. Now the first one is ready. Start the second one. So at that moment, we have two versions, one part of the previous version and one part of the second version. So right now, it's going to delete on both, and now we have the two pods. OK, great. So let's try to do another change just to see um, what does that work. So I'm going to just change encode to encode prettily. So instead to be one line, it's going to be multi-line because, yeah, that's developer experience. Uh, up. No. So now it's going to reduce the build. But what we are going to do now is to try to check when it's, done. it's doing the rolling update. So let's wait until we get the rolling update. It's doing the build. OK, so rolling update. And now I'm going to hammer it a little bit. So old one, old one, old one, old version, old version, old, old, 
old. Oh, oh, new version, new version, oh, old version, new version, old version, new, still old. So you see that right now I had two versions running, but it's fine. And now we have both new version, so fine. So let's try to do something a bit more nasty. I'm going to the pod, I'm going to click on it, I'm going to go to the terminal, and here I'm in the terminal of my pod, like SSH connect. So I'm going to do a PS. A PS. Uh, uh, PS? Oh yeah, just PS. Um, and I found this interesting process here, which is a process one, which is actually my application. What we do when we have an application, uh, a PID, as a developer, we do a kill. And now, it will detect that one of the pod is not ready. It should detect it. Or maybe it already has restarted it. Uh, I can't remember which one it was. Let's see. No, none of them has. Hmm. OK, no, doesn't want. Well, if I cannot kill, I will do something different. I will get to the pod list here. I will take this one, and I'm going to delete it. Yes, so to simulate a crash. But what's happening here is that it's terminating, but as we have a deployment that say, oh, you told me that I need always two pods, it will immediately create a new pod, and I still have a three scaling to two. So it's terminating the first one and a scaling to two. But right now I have two pods running. OK, but a microservice is not really a microservice if we are not consuming it. And it's what I'm going to do right now with a second microservice. Um, it's going to be a front end on top of that one. And um, what it's going to do is relatively simple. I'm going to call the first microservice, retrieve my shopping list, and for all items from my shopping list, I'm going to, to call a pricer service that I found, that is done by another team, and so on. And every time I have a, a result for my pricer, I'm going to write that inside uh, an HTTP response. So first thing is that I need two services. But if you have seen my previous code, I was using uh, callbacks. And you don't really want to use callbacks, because the first thing you will do when you use callbacks is to change your indentation of your ID to, to be two spaces. So at least it fix the issue between time and space. It's two spaces. Um, so here I'm going to use Eric Java 2. And because thanks to Eric Java 2, we, we are going to have a bit better API. So I'm going to use service discovery again to get the pricer service and to get uh, the shopping backend service. So that's the same call we did, but instead of get web client or get a Redis database, no, I get a single, a single little data stream that can contain at most one value. So I have these two single, S1 and S2, and I want to continue my execution when both have received their value, like a bit like a future. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to say zip, S1, S2, and when both have been completed, or one of them has failed, um, uh, no, when both have completed successfully, I will do, I will execute this code here, and this code is going to do pricer equals p, uh, shopping equals s, so just add, uh, add value to, the, to, my, uh, to my fields, and then I will just return what I'm doing here. So an HTTP server. Something to very important about uh, Rx and all those uh, reactive programming is that by default it's lazy. It's not going to do anything until someone do a subscribe on it. Subscribe means, oh, by the way, I've described all your flow and all your transformation, but actually do need, do need them. And when you do the subscribe, it's going to materialize the whole flow and get it running. So now I should have my pricer, my shopping, and uh, my HTTP server running. And my HTTP server is doing a very, something very simple. Get shopping list here. And it's what we want to, where we want to call the two services. Um, I'm going to use chunk request. And this is because I want to control my memory. Chunk request is something that exists since HTTP 1.1, and instead of 
computing the whole payload of my HTTP response, I'm going to uh, write it chunk by chunk. So the client will have to aggregate it. So the idea of this is that imagine that I have a very, very big shopping list. And if I'm uh, computing the whole payload of my shopping list, I'm going to consume my memory to store this payload until I get all the results. And I don't want to do that, because this is going to blow your memory. And if you have 10,000 requests that do that, you're dead. Chunk request, as soon as I have a result from the pricer, I'm going to write it immediately to the client. So my memory will contain at most one. Again, I efficiently used the uh, uh, memory that has been granted. So what I'm doing here, just calling shopping. So a web client, uh, what I retrieve from, my, uh, uh, from this here, is just an HTTP client. Vertex HTTP client, all non-blocking, uh, all asynchronous. And I'm going to use this, price, this client uh, to do get shopping, uh, uh, to call slash get shopping. I don't have to set the uh, URL, port, and so on. Why? Because I'm using service discovery, and the service discovery know where my service is. That's why I'm using service discovery. I don't care if the port is not 8080, but 90 or 1234, because service discovery knows that and will give me a web client already configured. So the only thing I know, I should know, is the contract of your uh, service, which is like here, slash shopping. So I'm calling it, well, I'm creating a single that call it, and I want to take the body and retrieve a JSON object. So now I'm going to do this scene here. So I have done this part, and for each entry, I'm going to call the pricer. So what? I will take my single, I will subscribe on it, here, I have my JSON, so that's my shopping list. I will create a flowy ball from this shopping list. So a flowy ball is a stream, but not from one element, but from several elements. So from this uh, uh, flowy ball, I need to call my presser for each of these uh, entry. So I got an entry here, and I'm going to use a uh, uh, to retrieve the price using the pricer and the entry. Fine. So for each entry I have in my shopping list, I'm going to call the pricer. I'm going to use concurrent access because I don't care about this service. So if I have five, uh, five items in my shopping list, I'm going to call this pricer five times concurrently. And every time that I have an answer, uh, subscribe. I'm going to write it to my HTTP response. So it's what I'm going to do here. Um, if I get my, uh, uh, I would call that JSON. Yeah. No, it's already used. Uh, let's call that REST, OK. I'm going to write uh, the content inside my HTTP response. So I just use um, write product line. This is my server's response. And you just need REST, OK. If there is an error, because it may happen, I will just do the same thing I was doing before, generate a 500. But because it's a chunk request, right now the client still thinks that it's open. So when I've done all my um, uh, product, when I got the price for all my product, I just need to, co to close, at least to end my uh, response. And now it should be fine. So yeah, we can. Thank you, IntelliJ. Oh, just believe that this is more readable. This is debatable. But OK, um, I will go back to, my, to this project. So this project is using a f um, Maven plugin to do everything we did with the Docker file, but automatically. Fabric 8 deploy. So this plugin is called Fabric 8 Maven plugin. And it's going to take my code to package it, interact with OpenShift. Uh, it will compute the metadata because it, the Fabric and Maven plugin knows about Vertex, so it knows how it needs to run inside Vertex and will uh, send that to OpenShift. It's what we have right now, a build here. So it's a build. We can look at the log. You will see that it's a bit more complicated here. It has 24 layer because it's using what we call a set, uh, S2i. So it's, uh, S2i is a standard way to build your application. It's generally provided by your ops, because you know exactly how your Java system must run, the 
all the flags, all the uh, garbage collection, and so on. So it makes things very complicated and much slower to start, but yeah, it's prod stuff. Um, and now we should run somewhere here. It's probably there. So if I do this, it's going to call for my shopping list the price. Oh, so the price is just doing random things. So uh, I need 12 coffee. So this is uh, calling the pricer saying, OK, what would be the price of this? So that's a very expensive coffee. Man, that's more than Starbucks. Um, eggs and bacon. But the bacon is cheap. Love this country. Um, so the only thing here is that we are using this pricer service. And this pricer service, you know, there is something always weird about services you don't control is that they may not work. And what I'm going to do here is to toggle toggle this pricer service to a slow mode. And now everything is slower because this pricer service is taking three seconds to answer all my requests. So you can expect it to be nine seconds, but no. Because we're using a flat map and we are calling this pricer service concurrently, we are enqueuing the three requests. All requests are delayed by three seconds, but when it, uh, when it gets the result, it sends me everything back. So instead of being nine seconds, it's only three seconds. So it's already good. It's already make build for speed. But we don't want to wait three seconds, right? So we need a kind of a resilience pattern here to improve this uh, resilience. And for this, I'm going to use a circuit breaker. So a circuit breaker is a simple object uh, that will monitor an interaction uh, with your, uh, up here, uh, 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 an, an interaction, a distributed interaction, and will monitor the number of failures, the timeout, and so on. And depending on the number of failures and timeout, it will stop calling the service, calling a fallback immediately. And periodically, it will try to see if the service is back again. And depending if it's back again, it will call it again or just uh, uh, go back to, to the state where it it's not calling it and just using a fallback. So Vertex comes with its own circuit breaker. Um, um, you can also use Histrix, which is the most famous circuit breaker today. Uh, it's just yeah, here. I gave it a name for monitoring purpose. If uh, there is a failure, I'm going to call the fallback. At three failures, I stop calling the service. Every five seconds, I will try to see if the service is back. And uh, my timeout is one second. Obviously, that's a sensible default. You can change that. So I need to, instead of doing that, um, use a circuit breaker. So it's what I'm going to do now. I will use circuit breaker dot rx execute with fallback. I have a first lambda, and I have a second lambda. So the first lambda is a command I'm going to execute. Uh, this command is very simple. Is this, and I'm going to report the success or the failure using uh, a, a future object. Mm -hmm. No, not this one. Uh, yeah, no, so it should be this one. Let's see. Um, and when I have an error, I will just do a call a fallback, and this fallback will just take the entry. Uh, that is name entry, and just display the fallback. So why do you don't want to work? Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unexpected return value. I don't need a return here. And that's all. So now my call to my pricer is actually uh, uh, using a circuit breaker, this one here. When it's done, it's a report on a future. So a future is just a deferred result. If it's failed, then we count. We say, oh, OK, it's a failure. If it's successful, everything is fine. And that's my fallback that we will see what it's doing. The rest of my code doesn't change. So now I'm going to deploy this. So obviously, IntelliJ told me that I can be a bit smarter. Like, I can do this. I don't need this to. OK, I don't need this to. OK, I don't need this too. So it's like I have no idea what I'm doing, but oh, and actually, he has no idea what he's doing either. But no, it's like I'm writing Java 8 fluently and looks more complicated, but well, sometimes it's good to have the structure. I don't know. That's my personal opinion. 
So it's doing it, so now it's probably uh, where it is. Oh, it already has started? Okay, so now if I'm calling my service again, so again, my presser in the slow mode, and because I love JavaScript, this is a tribute to JavaScript, try to call the presser, the presser doesn't answer, so it's a not a number. So we can try to call it, and once it detects that the service is dead, it will stop calling it, so my answers are very fast, and periodically it will try to call and see if the service is back again. So let's imagine the service is back. No, it's going to call it. Oh, it was not time to check. It was not time to check. Oh, it was time to check, and it's successful, and now that next time, everything is back. And that's all. So, let me, uh, where is this? What we have seen um, in this, uh, ooh, sorry, wrong page. So what we have seen in this 45, 50 minutes is how to develop reactive microservices using Vertex on top of Kubernetes slash OpenShift. Uh, all the features I use are just, except the build, are just Kubernetes features, so everything that I've shown is usable uh, uh, on uh, Kubernetes, in plain Kubernetes. Um, remember, we want to do microservices, and microservices are complicated. You need to have an infrastructure that will help you to deploy, build, manage, and keep everything on track. So like logging, distributed logging, metrics, and so on. So typically in OpenShift, uh, that's, typical, that's uh, uh, OpenShift specific. If I go to my price or service here, um, I go to the pod here, I can immediately go to my administration console, and I get a GMX monitoring, so for example, if I go to Javalang uh, memory, no, you don't want to do memory? Go to memory, yeah. So I have uh, the amount of memory and so on, and you can see that it's very, very small because, well, uh, uh, it's Vertex, and Vertex uh, keep, is very small in terms of footprints. Same thing in terms of thread. All the code I've done is just one thread per microservices, so there is no, there is almost no uh, uh, context um, uh, uh, thread switch, except for the garbage collection. Um, so that's actually very important to, to keep that in mind, that if you want to do mic microservices and you are choosing a container approach, you need to think that the runtime you are going to use, your framework you are going to use, need to be container native, and it's what Vertex is. It's going to use efficiently the resources you give to the container. Um, you may ask why not using another toolkit and so on. So first, Vertex is about freedom. In the Vertex team, we have absolutely no idea what you are doing. What's your business? The only people who are the experts of your application, that's you, that's not us. So we don't have to tell you how you are going to shape up your system. You decide, you are well, skills, you are a seasoned developer, or even you want to try things, it's what Vertex provides, freedom. Vertex is polyglot. I did Java and Air with Java. You like Scala? We support Scala. You like Kotlin? We support Kotlin. Groovy, Ceylon, Ruby, JavaScript, and I think I'm forgetting one, but I can't remember which one. Go to the web page and you will see all of it. So, if you're interested by Vertex, you can follow us on Twitter or, or go to this page here. Uh, this is a book. Do I have internet? Yes, no, I don't have internet, so I cannot show you. It's a free book, uh, 70 pages that will explain everything I did in much more details and see other uh, Vertex features such as the event bus and clustered event bus. Uh, it has a chapter on Kubernetes, uh, but it's the last chapter, so you will need to read the 45 or 50 first page first. Um, but it's only 70 pages, so that's fine. If you're interested by OpenShift or Kubernetes, you can check it here. That's the open source one. There is several variants and several flavor of OpenShift. That's uh, the open source upstream or follow us on at OpenShift. And if you want to learn, um, go there, uh, go to this page. You will have many, many articles about uh, OpenShift containers and so on. And if you want to learn and try without having to install OpenShift anywhere, go to learn.openshift.org and it's a uh, uh, interactive experience where you are going to, de to deploy directly on OpenShift. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have questions, I'm here, we have a couple of minutes.
Uh, yeah, yeah, so you need to use this microphone here, so you will need to do such an exercise of your day. So you're good. Thanks, thanks for the uh, demos. I was very impressed, by the way. Um, here's my question. If security is kind of a big concern for a lot of folks, and um, we didn't, you didn't go much into that, do you mind spending a little bit of time talking about that? And, and I was interested in particularly, I, I was aware of, of the event bus being available in JavaScript on the client side, you know, and being able to see that. And how do we uh, put security around that kind of thing? So th there is... Uh but, uh, security is a big topic. First, if you need to pass credential to your application, you should not hard code your credential inside your application. That's bad. So Kubernetes provides the concept of secrets, and Vertex understands that. So we'll give you your credential without having to write them inside your code. So that's the first thing, but that's uh, one thing. Uh, then, if you want to, uh, to do security uh, for your uh, service, for your REST endpoint, for example, then we provide in Vertex something called authentication, and you can delegate your authentication using OAuth or many other things like uh, LDAP and so on. Uh, we recommend inside OpenShift to use something called Keyclock, which is a um, Red Hat Project 2, which will let you uh, uh, do security with your service. The event bus. So, um, the event bus is, well, it's an event bus on which you can send message, and one of the capacity of the event bus is to have the browser receiving the message that are sent by any nodes that are on the event bus. So it's very powerful. Uh, you don't have to deal with WebSockets or to uh, understand what are the protocols supported by your browser because it will negotiate the transport for the browser. That means that if you have a recent browser, it's going to use WebSocket. If you are using Internet Explorer 6, is going to use an iframe, and it will degrade smoothly. But you should not use Internet Explorer 6, especially if you're interested by security. Uh, so in that case, what is going to happen is that you will use HTTPS and on the WebSocket side. So SuckJS is going to use uh, VSS, so Secured WebSocket, where we have a certificate, and the um, transport layer is encrypted using the certificate. That's how it's going to work, so HTTPS. Does that? Uh, and the event bus can also use, even internally, can use uh, TLS uh, to communicate between the, the nodes. It's up to you to decide what kind of security you want for the event bus. Uh, TLS is well, the default and the most used uh, uh, security feature. Yeah, you need to, <laughs> to go the back again. <laughs> there was no one else at the mic, so I thought I'd grab it again. So. Um, when you're talking about um, HTTPS on the WebSocket, or basically the, the event bus connection there yes. from the browser to the, to the back end, um, are there already packages out there that let you hook in um, security in that context and, and have like password, username, password authentication? What are those packages, you know, and, and you know, what, what are the, what are the Toolkits that that you got that y'all would recommend we consider using out of the box. Um, I turn to things that uh, JWT, uh, uh, JavaScript Web Token. I'm not sure that it's JavaScript, maybe JSON Web Token. So. Uh, is uh, is way, is something very powerful that people should use more. And then, unfortunately, because it's a very complicated protocol, but OS2. OS2 is a kind of protocol where when you read the spec, when you try to use it, you say, well, come on, that's complicated. But yeah, it's complicated because security is a complicated topic. So one of them. Or uh, no, there is a replacement for OS2, which is named OpenID. And OpenID would be a uh, thing. Uh, all of these are supported by uh, Keyclock. We, we need to, so, yeah. So uh, right. I will be in front of the, we're well, probably this door here, and if you have any other question, I will be just there. Thank you. <laughs>